Praise God. Well, James, the first chapter. I love the book of James, a uh, book of practical wisdom. Um, very good book for uh, baby Christians to study. You know, the book of John, uh, also the book of James. Very practical wisdom for your walk. And uh, very uh, great revelation concerning God, the character of God. And uh, also uh, a, a great revelation on, uh, I would say, the, um, the drama that we're involved in here in this world. You know, the walk that we're walking here. Uh, what we have to face. What the Christians, the early Christians were facing in their walk. You know, the early, early Jewish believers. This was primarily written to the Jewish book. There was, you know, we, it, it applies to us also because we're all spiritual Jews. But, you know... Last week, um, you know, we covered, you know, the, the, the difference, you know, that, that men place on being rich and somebody being poor and, you know, uh, God treats everybody the same. There's no, there's no respect of persons with God. doesn't treat anybody any differently. We have a tendency to judge people, you know, according to their status, you know, in our culture. You know, we have a, we have a, a, an inclination to look down on people that are possibly poor, you know, or, or, or destitute. You know, here recently I have had contact with people around the world that are in a position financially. I mean, it's not any, you know, it's not any behavior of, of their own. You know, a lot of it has to do with their spiritual atmosphere in their country. Some of it has to do with their culture, you know, but these people are not blessed like we are in our nation. I mean, we're so blessed in our nation. You know, I just give God the thanks that, you know, the little that I have compared to what other people have around the world. You know, I'm rich. I am very rich. You know, I, I, I've talked to some people overseas that would just love to come to this country and love to have the opportunity that we have and the freedom that we have, you know. Uh, you know, I, I listen to people on the news. I listen to people, you know, in the political arena. And I, I didn't realize I was going to get political this morning. But I, I hear people all the time talking about how bad it is here in the United States. And how evil our government is. And, you know, how, how we need to change. We need to, we need to change from the, the, the democratic form of government that we have. The republic that we have based upon these great documents like the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And we need to adopt a more uh, socialistic government so everybody can have the same. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that. You know, it teaches that if you work and you believe God, you know, and you pray that God will bless the work of your hands. God has never instituted a government whereby, you know, you just lay around and somebody else works and distributes their wealth to you. That's not, that's not godly. You know, the Bible said if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. You know, so these people are deceived. They, they're spoiled. You know, we're all spoiled to a degree, but these people are, they're spoiled. I mean, they're entitled and they don't realize what they're wanting. You know, just look around you. I, I just say, look around you at the governments who, you know, we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. You know, I don't apologize for that. You know, I was a, I was a beneficiary of it. For, for the sacrifices that others made. But this is the greatest nation. Sure, there's injustices. Because it's a human government. It's going to have failings and faults. But you know, we're still blessed. We're so blessed. You know, and I think people don't realize it. I think people that have that idea that America is a bad country, they need to go live somewhere else for a while. You know, and, and I'm not putting a spin on it, but Mexico, go to Mexico and live for a while. You know, go to one of the South American countries and live for a while. You know, go to Russia and live for a while. Go to China and live for a while. You know, go to some of the Arab nations and live. Yeah, right. Don't go with your money. Just go and, you know, uh, see who's going to take care of you. See who's going to give you a check. See who's going to uh, provide you with a, a means to buy food if you're destitute. You know, just go around the world and just see. And it'll make you thankful. For what we have because we're definitely spoiled here and uh you know i i heard one lady say the other day i'll buy you a ticket if you if you feel like you've been mistreated 
You know, my, my great grandfather came from Germany. He, uh, it wasn't good in Germany when he came in 1850, not 1857, but like 1877 or 1880. Came to this nation. No, it was a little bit earlier than that because he fought off the coast of New Orleans for the Union Army. He was a, he was a, he was a Yankee. And he, he, he joined the Navy so that he could become a United States citizen. And he was injured, <coughs> excuse me, offshore <coughs> in a battle. And he made his way to the United States, and he was glad to get here, you know. So my grandfather was an immigrant, you know, and uh, I, I tell you what, I, I, I don't want to leave and go to Germany, you know. I want to stay right here in the United States where I'm blessed, you know. And I've heard other people say, if you feel, if you feel like you're being unjustly treated, you know, if you want to go back to your homeland, <coughs> or, excuse me, <coughs> wherever your, your, your parents immigrated from, he said, I can guarantee that it's not going to be as good as it is here in the United States. You know, so we need to give thanks. The Bible talks about prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks for our government. You know, you may not like the person that's in office, but you still pray for them, and you can still be thankful. Oh, well, I don't know why I went that way, but maybe God had somebody listening this morning. But let's go to the book of James in the first chapter. <clears throat> you know, we talked about... Uh, people enduring temptation last week we all face temptation you know and the bible says be not soon shaken when you when you face challenges excuse me <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> don't be soon shaken when you face challenges you know when you're being tempted because we're all going to be tempted we're all going to be tried we're all going to be put to the test. Now, God does not tempt, and we're going to go into that a little bit. God does not tempt a man with evil. That's the enemy that tempts you with evil. But we're all going to have to face a temptation. All of us. And we're going to be tempted by the evil one. He's going to tempt you. He's going to bait you, is what he's going to do. He's going to put that bait out there. Sister Francis talks about bait. He'll bait you. Your bait may be something different than mine. Mine might be a completely different area. But you're going to have to endure that. Be not soon shaken, but followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See? So you, there's a temptation. There's a choice. Thank you. I appreciate that. I might not drink it, but I appreciate it. I want to clear up. Verse 14, it says in the first chapter of the book of James, it said, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So there's an enticement there. The enemy, the enemy will bait that hook for you. And it's going to come. I mean, there's no way around it. You live here in this world. This is a dress rehearsal. So you're being given a choice. Then verse 15 says, then when lust has conceived, now how do you conceive something? How is something conceived? It's not just the enticement. You know, you can be enticed. But there has to be a conception. So you're, you, the enticement has to be joined together with something else. You have, to, you have to join your will and you have to, like Paul said, yield yourself to that temptation. You know, you need to be very careful what you yield yourself to. You know, you may think, well, you know, I just yield myself a little bit. You know, God will forgive me. You know, he'll... He'll understand that I'm human, I'm dust, you know, and he, you know, I, I, I'll just ask him to forgive me. But, you know, I know people who have done that and they've yielded to a temptation instead of yielding unto righteousness. Instead of, because you have the power to yield. The Bible says being servants, being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So you're a servant of righteousness. If you're a Christian, that's who you are. But you can still choose to yield yourself because of weakness or whatever reason or pleasure or whatever it is past uh, association with something. 
And you can choose to yield yourself to that and look. The enticement there, the hook there, is to hook you. You know, I know people that have yielded to the temptation to drink. And then they end up in a quandary. They end up being a problem drinker. Because they yielded that first time. And then it begins a cycle in their life of guilt and shame and condemnation. And then whenever that comes, then usually people hide. They hide from God. They don't run to him. They feel ashamed. And so it begins a cycle. And the Bible says it brings forth death. It brings forth sin, and sin in the end brings forth death. See, that sin starts working in a person. And it may be another area in your life. You know? I, uh, I had somebody send something to me on my phone that was not a good thing. And, and I was shocked that somebody would send something like that to me on the phone. And uh, I asked them to please remove it, you know? And I deleted it off of my, my part on Messenger. And, uh, but I couldn't remove the other part. I asked them to remove it. And uh, I was telling a friend of mine who I knew had a problem with this. I said, I'm like, look, man, this person sent this to me. And they were like, well, can I see it? And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> Why? I said, because you have a problem with that. That's a stronghold. That, that was a stronghold in your life. And I'm not going to allow you to be tempted by that. You know, that's why Paul said you have to be very careful about what you do around other people. Even though you may have a strong constitution and conscience about that matter, you don't need to put that out in front of somebody else. You know, Jesus, he, prayed, he said, pray this way. Deliver us from evil. Look, I don't care how old of a Christian you are, how mature you are. You still need a Savior. You still need God's keeping power. Now to Him that's able to keep you. You need to be kept by the power of God. It's not anything. You don't get, you don't get to be such a big Christian that you don't need to be kept from temptation. Let me tell you what. It's out there and the enemy is a strategist. He's going to maneuver you and it's going to be, I mean, it almost seem like magic how things happen fall into place. It's why it's because he's playing. I say this over and over again. He plays chess. He doesn't play checkers. So we have to rely on the wisdom of God to help us in these situations. That's why he's talking about count it all joy when you fall into divers tests. He said immediately after he said give me and pray, pray and ask God for wisdom. Because we need God's wisdom in dealing with the enemy. You know, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. How many of you ever read that before? But the end of those ways is death. There's a way to walk with God and to obey God and to hear his voice. And you may not understand why God is wanting you to do something or, or, or why God is doing things a certain way. And, and, and you don't understand that you think God's trying to, uh, uh, how would I keep you from something? Beneficial when he's really saving you. He's really positioning you to succeed. Because God's all about you succeeding, not in the sense of the world's way of looking at things, but, but by you succeeding according to the wisdom of God. You know, he'll actually keep you, he'll actually hold you back until you're ready. Because God is preparing you See, it's all about preparation with God. Just look back at the Old Testament saints and how God held them back. Some of them were actually put in prison as a place of preparation. See, well, that's an unpleasant pleasant place to be prepared. I understand that. But you have to trust the wisdom of God in your situation. Let's read on down. It says, verse 16, Do not err, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. 
See, God is not the problem. People err when they think that you know evil comes from God. Because God does not have any evil in heaven. You know, and we need to have a right perspective when it comes to God. I mean, God has taught me this. And I'm not a fully educated disciple yet, but one thing I have learned that God is good. And the things that come into your life, everything that comes into your life is not from God. It's not from God. Some things come because of your own foolishness. You know, you know, the Bible, you know, I love the book of Proverbs. It says, you know, though you, though you grind a fool with a pestle and mortar. You know what a pestle and mortar is? You know, the old, if you watch the old westerns like gun smoke, let's just bring gun smoke. You go to the pharmacist, you know, he's got this ceramic bowl and he's got this like, like plunger and he's, and he's grinding this stuff up, making a fine powder out of it or a paste. And it says, though you grind a fool and with a pestle and mortar, still you won't separate his foolishness from it. So people do foolish things and they, they say foolish things and they make wrong choices that are not according to the scripture or they do things rashly and they get themselves in trouble. And they find themselves in a quandary. But, you know, God will rescue you if you'll cry out to him. You know, and then there are things that the enemy brings into your life. And he brings it into your life to destroy you. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy and we need to recognize those things. That when bad things happen to us or you suffer loss or you suffer sickness or you're defrauded or stolen from or something happens to a family member, it's not God doing it. It's the enemy doing it. Or some of their own choices or a combination of things. You know, a lot of times when people make wrong choices, that's when the devil moves in with a strategy. And then he'll try to camouflage it to make it look like God did it. That God's to blame. Who, who hath made this man blind? Who sinned? You know, is him or his parents that he was born blind? You know? And, and Jesus straightened out the whole issue, didn't he? He said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. You know? He just kind of put that issue to the side. You know? That's, all, that's a wonderful thing about redemption. It doesn't matter who did it. Fools, because of their sins and iniquities, are afflicted, the Bible says. Their soul draws near to the gates of death. Then they cry out to the Lord, the Bible says. So you see God's mercy at work. Even in redemption, people that make wrong choices, maybe you think, well, they made their bed. Well... Jesus made another bed for people. He's about redeeming people. Paying the price for people. He's the one that suffered so that you wouldn't have to. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and make dumb choices. But God's in the redemption business. He's there to redeem people. You know, when I look at the life of Jesus, he's ultimately good. I mean, he never called fire down from heaven on anybody. <laughs> he never sent away anybody empty-handed. If anybody ever came to him in humility, he was always there to save, to restore, to heal, to deliver. He was always there. And that's the way I look back. If I want to see God, I look at Jesus. Now, we don't have a perfect example of God's character, love, and nature in the Old Testament. It's a shadow. It's a mystery hidden in the Old Testament. But it's fully revealed in His Son. He has spoken to us by His Son. That's what the Scripture says. So if I want to get a real look at God, the Father, I have to look at His Son. I have to see what His Son did in His earth walk. My experience, look. Paul said, I, you know, he said, that he was, he was, he was uh, content in whatever situation I find myself, whatever circumstance I find myself in, I am there with content. 
One translation says, I'm independent of circumstances. I like that. See, once you get your perspective right on God and on his kingdom and on the heart of God and the nature of God and the plan of God, it, it's not that nothing's going to come against you. It's just that those things should never affect you. Paul said, I'm content. I know how to suffer lack. I know how to have a full supply. You know? And then right after they said, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. That's what he's talking about. Paul had one aim. He had one plan. He had a single eye. He had one voyage. And that was the call. That was the destiny that Jesus set before him. That's the same way with Jesus. You look at the life of Jesus. He had one voyage. He didn't have plan B. He had to do the will of the Father. You see, once you, once you understand how good God is, and once you understand His plan for your life, as revealed in the Scriptures, and then as He reveals His voice to you through your life as you seek Him, it's not that you're not going to have things come against you, because they had many, many, many things come against the Apostle Paul. But he had one voyage. And because his, his perception of God, because his eye was single, he never let anything move him from his voyage. It's the same way with Jesus. He had much opposition. You know, they, they were counseling against him. They were, they were having strategies against him. They tried to catch him in his words. You know, they, they spoke against him. They blasphemed him. You know, they did everything they could to hinder and stop him, but he had one voyage. And he knew his father. And he loved his father. And that was what was important to Jesus. One voyage he has. His eye was single. And so he never let any of the things that came against him affect him. He never let it stop him. He never let it hinder him. Jesus never got bummed out. You know, you never read in the Bible where Jesus is sitting off to himself with his, with his head in his hands and Peter walks up to him and says, Master, what's wrong? Can you see that? Well, Peter, I'm just not having a good day today. You know, I'm really down. You know, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Does that sound like Jesus to you? It doesn't even fit the narrative. It doesn't even fit Jesus. You know? It might fit me, but it doesn't fit him. Why? Because his, per he was, his perception was right concerning God and the plan of God. And he was a man, anointed by the Holy Spirit, walking in the earth, and he was revealing the Father to us. And it's the same way with us. You know, I remember Jesus, that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. One of my favorite stories. When Jesus, he said, let us pass over to the other side. Okay, what's God's plan? Passing over to the other side, right? Okay, so Jesus, you know, this is, just, this is Jesus. He goes down inside the boat and he goes to sleep. Sounds like me. He likes to take naps. So I know I'm following Jesus' plan for my life because I love to take naps. I told somebody one time, I said, on my deathbed, I'm going to gather my family around and talk about all the good naps I had while I was alive. I, I slept so hard the other evening, I mean the other afternoon, I had to drink coffee to wake up. Very unusual for me. I mean, I slept hard. And the, Bible, you know, the Bible talks about sleep being good. Just don't sleep too much when you ought to be working. Okay? So, but I get up real early in the morning, so I have an excuse. I get up 3 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning. And about 10 o'clock, I have a full day in. Y'all are just getting started, you know. So I have an excuse I can sleep. Because I have other things to do later in the day. But anyway, our perception of God is all important. How we see God. How we perceive Him. John said that we may know Him. See, we have to know that he's good. We, we can have no question in our mind. No matter what comes against you, no matter what happens in your life, it should never, 
ever called to question the goodness of God. You know, and the enemy would love you to question the goodness of God and the love of God. You know, there was a time in my life when I struggled so badly with the love of God. I mean, it was tormenting. You know, the Bible says that, that fear hath torment, doesn't it? When you, don't, when you don't know and believe the love that God has for you, God is love. And I had such a struggle with that. For years I struggled with it. You know, until finally God got a hold of me and caused me to be rooted and grounded in love. To where I know God loves. There's no question in my mind that God loves me. I used to tell God, you know, Lord, I know Jesus died for me on the tree, but I, I just need something else for you to do for me to prove your love for me. I don't say that anymore. I don't even think that anymore. You know, because of contrary feelings, feelings of guilt, feelings of regret, feelings of condemnation. Why? Because I wasn't properly taught the scriptures as it related to righteousness and the love of God and what actually Jesus did on the cross and why he did it. I didn't have a revelation of the cross of Jesus. I didn't, have a, I didn't have a revelation of the love of God that was demonstrated to me through the cross. And to me as an individual and not as a herd, though he did die for the whole world, herein is the love of God, of love of God manifest unto us because God sent his son to be a propitiation for my sins. You know, now God doesn't have to do anything else to prove his love to me. Nothing. No matter what I face, no matter what I go through, the trials, the tests, the temptations, you know, because I understand that God is good. Jesus was a revelation of his goodness. He went about, the Bible said he went about doing what? Good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Everywhere he went. He even told some cities, if I'd have done what I did in that city, Sodom, they would have repented. Boy, that's an indictment against that city, isn't it? I got to thinking about that this morning. Wow. If you were to say Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented and you didn't repent, that's quite an, quite an indictment, isn't it? Because Sodom and Gomorrah was pretty bad. But for you to actually have the Son of God come to your town and make that his headquarters... And you not repent as a city. That is a great indictment against you. Capernaum doesn't exist today anyway. <laughs> There's a lot of cities around there that do. But Capernaum doesn't. Chorazin doesn't. Bethesda doesn't. He upgraded those three cities. And told them you should have repented because of my goodness. So we need to understand the goodness of God. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. So if it's good and it's perfect, it comes from God. If it's bad, if it's evil, it comes from the enemy. We have to differentiate that. You know, even if God has to judge somebody or judge a nation or judge a city or judge a region, it's because of his goodness. Because judgment is always tempered with mercy. He's good. He's merciful. He delights in mercy. Most of the time when God has to judge something, it's because those people are stopping his love from reaching other people. That's why God usually has to judge, uh, judge something is because he's trying to reach them. He's trying to love those people. He's trying to reach somebody and someone is standing in the way and won't let it happen. So even in love, he judges. But God is good. Even in judgment, God is good. Because when he judges people, he's trying to get them to repent. Trying to get them to turn. Isn't he? God gives people opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. He wants them to repent because he delights in mercy. That's what the scripture says. The long suffering waits. That's what the Bible says. For the precious fruit. Why, why isn't Jesus coming? 
Well, I wish he'd come sooner. You know, I want Jesus to come and get us out of this mess. And the Father saying, I love people and I want people to be saved. I want people to be born again. Because God didn't save you to bring you to heaven. God saved you to bring heaven to earth. To affect men. Until he decides to come. So we need to bring heaven to earth. I had some Mormon missionaries come to my little stand yesterday. I was selling hot tamales on the riverbank. And I had some Mormon missionaries come by. And I called them over. And I talked to them guys. And you know what I did? I didn't argue with them about the Bible or doctrine or anything. You know what I did? I loved those guys. I honored them. I didn't honor what they believed. I didn't give them God's speed. But I developed a rapport with them. And I spoke to them about the things that... That was important to them like where they came from you know what part of the country they were from and, and i just i just invested in them i honored them you know i adorned the gospel and made it look good you know what i'm saying i, I planted seeds in these guys seeds of respect you know seeds of honor honoring them as a person and then next time they come then i'm going to start asking questions about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and then give them a witness and a testimony of my own life. But you know, first, you know, first you ought to lay a groundwork of respect and honor and honor a person and not dishonor them or not attack them. You know what I'm saying? But actually throw the net out there and trap them and then bring them in. <laughs> yeah, trap people. Bait them. Do like the devil does. Bait them with something good though. You know what I'm saying? I love that. God baited you. He sure did. He put, you know, he put his son on the cross and he gave his life for you. And then, you know, he did that before you ever, he, you know, you, there was no guarantee that you were going to choose to follow Jesus. But he did that for you. He baited you with his love. And it was irresistible to some people. It was, ir it was irresistible to me. I couldn't stay away from it. I couldn't stay away from him. I couldn't get away from the subject. Let me move on a little bit. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow from God's not going to change. He's good. He's always been good. He always will be good. There's no evil there. Now look what God did for us out of his goodness. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. That's talking about being born again. The born again doctor. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Talking about becoming new creatures in Christ Jesus. That's the first. When Jesus hung on the cross, it was to make you a new creature. When he rose from the dead, it was to make you a new creature. When the Holy Spirit came upon you when you heard the good news, it was to make you a new creature. And he made you a new creature so that he could come and live inside of you. And you could become a habitation of God through the Spirit. A temple of God among men. The witness, the Bible says. Ye shall, ye shall be witnesses. You know, when, when, when it talks about the tabernacle of witnesses, it means your evidence. You're the, it's the very evidence that God is here. Because he came to inhabit you. So that he could walk in you and you could walk with him. And you could cooperate in the kingdom. To bring heaven to earth. That's why he came. And it says... Verse number 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When we're being tempted, when we're going through a trial, the best thing to do is keep your words few and keep your ears open to what he has to say. Don't do a lot of talking. Don't get mad about having to go through a trial or being tested. I mean, that's, that's the first uh, response that a person usually has. When something is not within your control, that on, most, most of the time people get angry because they can't control a situation. If you see somebody get mad at you, it's because they can't control you. So their first, and that makes God mad too, when his people were out of control, the Bible says the wrath of the Lord was kindled. See? 
So the same reaction you're created in his image, and, but you've got to be careful because the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. So don't get mad because you're having to go through a, t a test or a trial. You know, you're facing uh, uh, challenges in your life. Don't get mad. Surely don't get mad at God. Because right before that, he shows us that he's not the problem. Be swift to hear. Why? Because we need to hear his voice. We need to hear what God is saying. He's going to give you guidance. You know, what has he said to you? When Jesus said, let us pass over to the other side, they didn't need anything else. They, they didn't need to, any more instruction. That, you know, they should have known in dealing with him and living with him that they were going to make it to the other side. Because he can control the winds and the waves. So in the same way, in your life, when you have a plan from God and you start on that journey, don't think there's not going to be challenges and don't, don't think God has, has forgot about you and don't get mad at God because you're facing challenges. Be swift to hear. Keep hearing and be careful what you say. Because you can wreak havoc with what you say. Speaking against God, speaking against the plan He has for your life, double-mindedness, calling into question the promises of God. You know, He made a promise to you, He's going to keep that promise. But you have a part to play, swift to hear. Be swift to hear, have your ears open to whoever God wants to use to speak to you. And be slow to speak and slow to wrath. Don't get mad. I know I have been, oh, I have went through so much anger in my life. Why? Because I was a spoiled brat. I didn't want to have to go through the process. I didn't want to have to go through the wine press. I didn't want, I didn't want God touching those things in my life that needed to be changed. I wanted him to just take me the way I was and put me where I wanted to be without going through the process. There is a process in the kingdom of God and it includes suffering and affliction and challenges. Just look at the old saints in the Old Testament. Look at the challenges that Abraham faced. I mean, look at the challenges of Noah. Look at the challenges of you know, of Job. Look at the challenges of King David. Look at the challenges of Joseph. Look at these men. If you want to walk with God, if you want to, to be a successful in God's kingdom in the way God wants to promote you and make you successful, because God's more interested in the process of what he's doing in you as a person and, and conforming you to the image of his son and not just making you successful in the eyes of the world. And he's going to bring you through and he's going to bring you out and you're going to be blessed. Amen. But you're going to be blessed in the right way to where it doesn't harm you, to where it actually benefits your life. And benefits you as a person. And benefits your character. And benefits your call. And makes you successful. The Bible says an inheritance hastily gotten in the end shall not be blessed. And I know the process is painful. It, it, you know, it's grievous, the Bible says. We have, we have to go through. But afterwards, how many of you have ever went through something and you look back and you're like, whew, I didn't enjoy that really, but man, I, I'm glad I got through it. I, I'm, I'm benefited by it. I'm a much better person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more peaceful and at rest now that I had to go through that. See, that's what God, that's God's aim is to bring you through. He's not always going to deliver you out. He's going to bring you through the fire. I mean, what a testimony, the, 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 the three Hebrew children. God didn't put the fire out. A lot of people want God to put the fire out. Lord, where's the water? <laughs> I'm waiting. You know, no water came. As a matter of fact, the furnace got hotter. And the word of the king prevailed. You know what? They cast him down in that fiery furnace. 
And even the people that threw them in there got burned up. But you know what? They didn't even have a smell of smoke. And their bonds were burned off. And they were walking around in the fiery furnace. You may feel like you're walking around in the fiery furnace, but I'm telling you, you're not walking alone. Yeah. And you're going to come up out of that with honor from God. Who would rather have honor from Him than I would have it from men. Amen? I'd rather have God exalt me. I'd rather have God smile and blessing on my life. But we've got to go through the process. And I'm not going to promise you it's going to be fun. I can promise you it's not going to be fun. Not as far as the flesh is concerned. But making that distinction, having that right perception, looking at that one journey with a single eye. Not just, the, not just the way the world. Uh, I look at people. Man, I see that on you. You see that too. I see people that are successful as far as uh, uh, the way the world deems success. And it makes me nauseated. They're, they're, they're not good people just because they're successful in the world's eyes. You know, their life is a mess and corrupt. You know, I was listening to Alice Cooper this morning. I don't even remember who Alice Cooper was. School's out for summer. You remember that song? <laughs> no. No, you don't remember that song, brother? Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was talking about how he, he, he had everything in his life. He had cars. He had houses. He had everything that a person could want. He said, but I had this big, gaping, empty hole in my heart that only Jesus could fill and he said, Jesus reeled me right in to satisfy me. He said, I was successful as far as the world was concerned, but I was so empty. And he said, I came back to Jesus, you know. And so we, we need to understand the most important thing in your life is your life precious faith. Your faith is the most precious thing you have. And no matter what you face, no matter what circumstances or challenges you have in your life, it should never affect your faith. It should never make you waver. Your faith should be set like flint. There's not even a choice. But you're living, number one, you're living for His great name's sake and for His glory. No matter what you have to go through. And I, you know what? I love the scripture. It said, adorn the gospel. Make it look good. The way you face challenges. The way you face adversity in your life. Make God look good. Because he's good. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention. Hallelujah. Y'all ready to worship this morning? Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. How many of you thankful? I know there's a lot of people thankful today. Praise the Lord. He's so good to us. Hallelujah.
come into this place to worship you, Lord. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just lift him up. Hallelujah. Let's just think about who he is, what he has done for us, and let's give him the glory this morning. Let's focus our hearts, our minds on him and nothing else. Let's put everything else aside. Let's not let it hinder entering in. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he is worthy. Well, I don't. I know it.
Jesus. 
I am all you need. I am enough, saith the Lord. You can search the deepest places on the earth and to the highest skies and the deepest oceans and beyond your imagination. You can search for wealth and goods and possessions and things and people. I say to you, you can search the depth of all things, but I want to tell you this morning, you'll never find anything like me. For I am higher and deeper and wider and bigger. Behold, I say to you that all you have need of rest in me and I say to you that I purchased everything you will ever need when I said it is finished on the cross the work was done for you saith the Lord so look to me and me exclusively for I am your source saith the Lord
that the Lord spoke to me this morning, even before the service started, as we were gathered in prayer around the altar. He said, you got to put something in if you want to get something out. You can't just sit there this morning and say, God, if you want to do anything for me, you got to dump it on me or whatever. It doesn't happen that way. You got to take the step. You got to reach in. You got to make a determination. I'm not leaving here today without a touch of the Holy Spirit on my life. And I'm going to tell you what, He's here. So you don't have to know that. You can sit through the whole service and not even know that the Holy Spirit's here working in the lives of people. I'm not pointing out anybody in particular, but all of us know. I'm just telling you, you got to put something in to get something out. If you need something from God, I know we put our trust exclusively in what he did on the cross, but I can still be dead to that if I want to be. But I can reach in. I can reach in and say, God, I really don't care about the person sitting by me right here. It's not about this friend. It's not about this spouse. It's not about this person. Lord, this is me. This is me and you. And I don't want to leave here without a touch from God. So therefore, I'm going to reach in and I'm going to touch you, Jesus, just like the woman who reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Lord, I need you this morning more than I need whatever else is going on in my life. I need you this morning. And I'm going to reach out, Lord. I don't care if i got to step on somebody to get to you. I don't care if i got to crawl on my hands and on my feet, on my knees to get to you, Lord. I've made up my mind. You said, come, all you that are weary and heavy laden. You said, come unto me. And I say, Lord, here I come this morning. I'm coming, believing you. Reach out and touch him this morning as we sing that one more time. And if you need a healing in your body, the healer's in the house. If you need peace in your mind, the, the peacemaker is in the house. If you need anything from God, there is nothing lacking in his provision this morning. But you got to reach out. Don't sit there and sleep. Don't sit there and think about what you're fixing to do. Reach out right now and say, Lord, I, I'm going to be reaching in. If nobody else does, I'm reaching in this morning. In Jesus' name, and I believe that I receive those things that you have provided for me. Reach out right now. Touch him right now. He's Reach out 
this morning that's still a part of worship you know, there's not very many things that we can really do for God but this is one thing we can do is bring our tithe and offerings to further his kingdom and so we thank God for that and uh, thank God for all of you at Oasis of Love who dedicate yourself to support this ministry we appreciate it from the bottom of our heart and we pray God's blessings upon every one of you that you will the goodness of God truly will chase you and, and supply you abundantly above and beyond anything because of your faithfulness to give. So God bless you as you give this morning. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside.
Uh, put the verse up there, if you would, Autumn, on uh, the first three verses there in Proverbs 31. And it says this, listen to it. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Well, let me just say this. I found one 50, 55 years ago. Well, no. I found one about 58 years ago. And when I found her, I thought I could tell she was a virtuous girl. I really, how many of you think you can tell sometimes? Come on, I, I really did. And, and I was not disappointed after I got better acquainted with her. But when I first found her, I felt like she was a virtuous woman. In fact, I knew she was a virtuous woman. And I thought that she was probably 10 years older than me. Because, man, she had a hat on. She'd wear a hat like Angela's or a hat like Terry's here. And back then, she had one of them, big old brown one. I mean, it was, it was big. And she had spike heels. And, and when she walked in the room, you noticed her. And come to find out, when I finally got a little better acquainted with her, I found out she wasn't 10 years older than me. She was just a little bit, just barely. And she's not very much older than I am right now. So don't, 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 think, don't think, well, I wonder how old Sister Francis is. I know how old the preacher is because he tells his age. Well, I'll tell you my weight if you want to know it. You can't tell by looking, but them virtuous women don't do that. And the scripture said, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. And how many of y'all know rubies are valuable, especially real, true rubies? It's far above rubies. And I, I'll be honest with you. If I hadn't had a virtuous woman, I probably would have been divorced a long time ago. Now, that don't mean if you're divorced, you wasn't virtuous. So don't read anything into it. It don't matter if you divorce don't mean you didn't have a virtuous woman. You might have. You might have been one that blew it. You might have been the one that messed things up. How many of y'all know? I know it takes two most of the time, but sometimes it takes one. <laughs> sometimes you get a hold of somebody that uh, you just can't, you know, the Bible says as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. Sometimes there's some people that just won't let you live in peace. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There's sometimes things are beyond your control that you can't help. And there's some things that after something blows up or messes up, let's just say like a domestic situation, please know that sometimes it's a whole lot better the, the next time or where you're at right now than it was years ago. So I'm not trying to, please know that. I know that and understand that. And I've seen situations that there's no way in the world nobody could have Nobody could have uh, solved the situation or worked it out or found, come to a resolution. Uh, I will say that if we'll get back, let me just go ahead and say, since I hit on this, I opened this can of worms and I probably shouldn't have. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit wanted me to, though. You know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, it's kind of like when the scribes and the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, well, Moses gave a writing of divorcement. The very first thing Jesus said, though, he said, yeah, but for the Hard because of the hardness of your heart. Come on, how many of you know if your heart wasn't so tough and got so hard and so callous sometime, maybe there's some things that could have been worked out. You know, I see a lot of head nods of a lot of people that's had some previous marriages. We're not picking on anybody for that. All I'm saying, though, is if we'll be soft and pliable before God, God can help us and God can cause some things to work out. And also, if we prayed about it more than we argued about it. And you know, the year for years there's been a sign up said, the family that prays together stays together. People would put that out. And how many of you know that? Jesus even said, a house divided against itself 
You know what he said? He didn't say may not stand. He said a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, it can't stand if a house is divided against itself. So let me just say, if you've got a virtuous woman, then you've got something as far, her price is far above rubies. Amen? Amen. And, and there's a lot of things that make up, and I'm not going to get into all this, there's a lot of things that make up a virtuous woman. But let's go ahead and read the rest of this text real quick, the next two verses. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he, she, he shall have no need of spoil. Isn't it neat when you got somebody you can trust and you don't have no need of spoil? You're not worried about it a bit when you ain't around? Come on. Isn't that awesome? Now what, what's, look at the next one. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And uh, honey, I, I just want to thank you right now in front of everybody for being a virtuous woman all these years and for doing me good and not evil and for my, my heart to safely trust in you and not worry about anything, any spoil of any kind. I really appreciate that. I really do. And how many of y'all would, uh, let me say, either like to say that right now or would like to have been able to say it? You can raise your hand either way. Say, how many of you? Say, well, a few of you. Some of you don't even want to say that. That's pitiful. <laughs> well, then you get what you, you reap what you sow then. You get, you get what you wanted. You get what you expect. You get what you're believing for. But I, I'm thankful that God blessed me and, and I prayed. I didn't just jump into you know, I, wouldn't, I didn't pay attention to Johnny Cash a long time ago. Johnny Cash said, We got married in a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. My wife's shaking her head right now because she didn't think the Holy Ghost was in that. I did. Some people, the reason they got trouble is because they, it, it wasn't love, it was lust. Come on. And lust... Lust won't build a relationship worth a flip. Come on, will it? Because the luster, you know, that's a lust and luster. The luster is liable to go off of that situation after they get it a few years, few, I mean, a few years later. Almost messed up again. I almost said pounds, but I caught it before I said it, so you didn't hear me say it. A few years and a few pounds later. The luster's liable to get out of it. But a virtuous woman is far above rubies. And so I want to just say, you know, thank God. Let me, let me, just, let me just say the next verse there, Genesis. I want to turn to this right quick because time's running out. And I want to let you go on time today, whatever on time is. But on time today for me is meaning just as close to 12 o'clock to be because some of you have... Mother's Day plan. Now listen to this. This is how it was in the beginning. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created them. Everybody say male and female. Amen. Now how many of y'all know that God is smarter than man? God is smarter than this council culture that's going on in our land and in our nation today. How many of y'all understand that? And if you, look, if you don't believe God, if you believe their way then, then you go out and buy you a bull if you want to get some milk. And you go out and buy you a rooster and you raise, you, you have you a bunch of eggs to eat with a rooster. I got a future farmer of America guy here, wave your hand at him. He's a teacher and I guarantee you he can know the difference between male and female even in animals. There is a difference in gender, and gender is important. Gender has always been important, and gender will always be important. But for the work of the Lord, God said through the power of the Holy Spirit, neither male nor female, it don't matter. God will use you, and he'll give you the same. You can do anything in the kingdom of God you want to do, basically. But we still can't take away with, you know, we're never going to, come on, you know what they wanted? I, I heard this this morning when, I mean this week when Francis was gone. I turned on the news one night and they're wanting people to say now to cancel our culture out. Now listen to this. 
We don't, we're not supposed to say, they said, what would be better? I'm talking some politicians said this. What would be better now? Don't say Happy Mother's Day. Listen to this. Happy Birthing People Day. <laughs> now, isn't that sweet? Now, how many of y'all heard that? How many of y'all heard? If you don't Google it, you can find it for yourself. They said, say what would be more proper and would not offend anybody and would not denote between the genders, you know. Happy birthing people day. Not happy birth, birthing peoples or I guess they want people to just birth one. Happy birthing people. People Day, not Happy Mother's Day. Because we're not supposed to say she or him or her or the woman with the dress on or the lady with the dress on. Let me tell you something. As long as I have breath and until Jesus comes, I'm going to say, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And I'm going to say him. I'm going to say her. Come on now. In the beginning, God made male and female. He created them. And if you'll go on and read in Genesis there, he'll let you know the woman was going to in travail give birth to children and her desire was going to be to please her husband. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on about how God put the, what he said. And I got to say this real quick because any words you say, man, grabs something and they flag you and they look at you. And but I've got something. Let's just, let's just go ahead. Well, let's skip Genesis because I already quoted it. Let's go to Leviticus 20 and 13. Watch this. If man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. And listen how hard this was on the law. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. Now, did you see that? Do you care what they say or do you care what he said? Come on now. Do you care what they say in the world? Do you care what? Not want to offend certain people of certain things that they like to do. And let's not call them male or female. And let's not care. Let's let men marry men and women marry men and women. Do you, want, do you care what they say? And do you, do you believe what they think? Or do you believe what he has already said and what's already established in heaven? And you say, that was old covenant. Oh, but you need to read the last chapter in the Bible. You'll find out. Let me, let me go ahead and make one point here and tell you something. Anything that was abomination in the sight of God, even under the law. He even said, don't let a male wizard or a female wizard. That's somebody in witchcraft and all, and people to communicate with the dead, and even witches and warlocks. He said, don't allow them to even live back then. Don't allow them to live in your land, he said. And if they were caught, he said, put them to death. And let me tell you something. If they remain in it till this day, then they've got death already. Because ultimately, when they stand before God, people are going to go to eternal life, or they're going to go to eternal death, eternal damnation. They're going to go to hell instead of heaven. And, and here's what it says in the last book of the Bible. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, here it is again, the abominable shall all have their part in the lake of fire. And see, I want people to miss the lake of fire. I want people to make their reservations in heaven. And I'm going to preach and say and tell the truth till Jesus comes. Even if they come in and lock me down and take me out. But I hope some of y'all hit them with the Bible on the way out. Amen. Righteously, I mean. You know, just quote the Word of God. Well, no, they'll take you with me if they did. But I've got to say what he said, and I've got to say what the Word of God says, and I'm going to do it without fearing what man can do to me, okay? Because I want people saved. I want people to live forever. And guess what? I want you to know he didn't promise a big old landslide of folks going to make it. Jesus said, few there be that find it. So everybody's not going to receive it. And a lot of people don't give a hoot or a rip what God says. But I want you to know one of these days God's going to have last say. And he said plain in his word that men should not lie with man as he does womankind. And if you need me to explain that further, I want you the next time 
If you crawl in bed with somebody and your plumbing is the same as the person you crawled in bed with and you're planning on having sex with them, then guess what, honey? You, you crawled in the wrong bed with the wrong person. And if you're a child of God, you all anyway. Come on, you want a little clear? Like the little boy standing there said, what's with all this gender stuff? Male and female. And the one little boy leaned over and said, well, it's like this. He said, you just look down there and he say, Willie or no Willie? And that settles it right there. <laughs> there were two little boys. <laughs> I mean, I hear laughing all over the building and I see somebody say, I can't believe he said that. Well, I think y'all are adult, adult enough. If you can take the garbage and the stuff that's in this world today being promoted by fake news and a lot of other things, then you can take the truth. And if you can't, then you're in the wrong, wrong church. We're going to preach the truth around here. We're not going to preach something that's false and going to send people to hell. I want, I want you to know, let me tell you something. The truth will set you free. The truth will make you free. And in the beginning, God created male and female. And that's how it's been ever since. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. Because I am not going to apologize for what God said. And I'm not going to apologize for what he wrote. God always distinguished between. Thank you for the, the approval. Right now, my approval rating may be 60%. Even in this church and by way of media, I have no idea what is proven. Maybe they'll send some of them. I think that means when they send a thumbs up, that means they like it. If they send a thumbs down, that means they hate it and they hate me, I guess. But God's always distinguished the difference between both yeah. sex, sexes, gender. Now let's look at Proverbs 31 and well let's look at verse 36 okay I mean excuse me 26 I'm sorry probably ain't no 36 let's see 26 Proverbs 31 26 but before we get there if you would have read some of the rest of the chapter you'd find out that this Proverbs 31 woman is a hard worker. She stays up late at night. Now look, when I hit something that you don't like or you don't approve of, just go ahead and say, oh me. This woman, this Proverbs 31 woman is worth a, far more than rubies. She was a hard worker. Come on. She was a hard worker. If you don't believe, somebody say, I'm a hard worker too. Yeah, you're a hard worker. Sometimes you work your mouth more. Well, I better shut up. Sometimes you work your mouth more telling your husband what to do than you do what you're going to do. Or yelling at the kids and we yelling threats out to them and then not doing what you say you'll do to the kids if you don't watch out. They were a hard worker, some of you. I didn't say all of you. They, she stayed up late and you know what else she did? She made sure that her family was okay. She, she went out. She, back then, she, they spun their material, their cotton and their silk and everything to make their clothing. Well, I know now you say, I do too. I go to Walmart and I spend my husband's money or I spend the government's money and I just throw it in and, and I, that's my the staff, you know, that's my spinning wheel. And look, that's okay. Look, thank, thank the Lord. I don't, how many in here still make your clothes the old fashioned way and you spin your yarn and make your cloth and do that? Okay, none. How many of y'all still buy material and then sew your clothes. Oh, come on, how many? Only a few. Well, not none, I mean. Okay, how many of you, you thank God for Walmart and sales? Or bales and whatever these Caicos and all this other stuff. How many of y'all thank God for that? How many of y'all thank God for rum and sales? Okay, praise God for that. But guess what? It is a crying shame. I'm not going to call any names now, but it is a crying shame. We used to have somebody in the church years ago there's been several people this way. And when they move and when they leave, their house is full of clothes, pile of clothes. You know why? 
because they were too lazy to wash those clothes and clean those clothes and prepare those clothes. They was not a Proverbs 31 woman or a Proverbs 31 person, okay? To, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? The clothes piled up in the floor, instead of washing and cleaning them, they just go buy some more because clothes are so cheap. And then they go, well, the this, this, this soap costs more than the new clothes do. No, it don't. No, it don't. No, it don't. Come on now. A Proverbs 31 woman, a virtuous woman, was a hardworking woman. And praise God for years, I had one of those Proverbs 31 hardworking women. Now she don't work so hard. She does. She works very hard. And now she don't have to. She don't, she don't have to work as hard as she used to work. But how many of y'all know that if you're going to be a virtuous woman, uh, there's a responsibility put on you whether you want it there or not. If you're going to be a godly woman and if you're going to be worth far above price of rubies. I don't know about you, but wouldn't you want to be something that God's proud of in, in His sight and be one of those kind of people that God is pleased with that He gives great reward someday when we get before God? Well, you know, come on now. Some, sometime if we need to take inventory and, and, and quit, you know, she was not idle. You could read in the, in the Word of God, this woman was not idle. She was a hard worker. She stayed up late to make sure her, her family was took care of, her children and her husband and all. And you know, you know what the man was doing then? I mean, it's amazing. It says her husband is known in the gates while he sits there. And I've always looked at, my, my, she's, he's sitting Everybody knows him because of his clothes and his wife making him and how good she does it and how good she keeps him dressed, you know. I know a lot of you guys, the women pick your clothes out. So it's about the same as them making it. They pick your clothes out and match your colors because guess what? You're colorblind. What's bad is when they're colorblind. But then your husband, they know you in the gates and they say, look at that. Uh, you know, Francis taking care of David. Look at this. Look at that nice do-rag David's wearing around town. David, David's got a do-rag to keep sweat out of his eyes and she keeps him in do-rags and, and then when he rides a motorcycle the helmet won't take the rest of his hair out and friend, everybody in town says there comes David with the do-rag his wife is really he's got a virtuous woman she's really taking care of him she stays up late to be sure my do-rags are clean and she did when the girls were young. She took care of them. She did sew a lot of clothes for the girls when they were little, even if they didn't want to wear them. She, they wanted to wear them. Uh, Jerry said they wanted to wear them. She did pretty, pretty things. And then look, verse 26. This is what we got to get with real quick. Verse 26. She opening her mouth with wisdom. Let me say something. If you're opening your mouth and it's not wisdom, Pray and ask God to give you wisdom. And if you can't open your mouth with wisdom, maybe a good sign is I'll keep it shut. Almost. You've got to talk some. But if you want to be a virtuous woman, a virtuous mom, a good mom, listen to this. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Let me just say, there's a whole lot of difference between kindness and meanness. How many of y'all have ever been answered in a mean way and you know it? Come on. All right. Help me out. I'm going to ask you again. How many of y'all know the difference, whether it be a woman or a man, it don't matter. How many of you know when somebody's speaking to you in kindness and not meanness? Okay. How many of y'all know I mean this in kindness this morning? Okay. I, I, I would like for people to be blessed above measure. I would like people to be blessed with a long life. How many of you know if we take the wisdom out of God's Word, He'll satisfy us with long life? Come on. And so if we'll say, okay, God, I haven't been measuring up in the past, but I want to measure up. You know, in your tongue ought to be, in your tongue ought to be kindness. In your tongue ought to be kindness. When women, when you talk to your husband, moms, when you talk to your husband and even children, there ought to be kindness there. Even if you say, I'm going to tear your butt up. I'm talking about to the kids. You ought not ever tell your husband you're going to tear his butt up. Come on now. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? There ought to be kindness, not meanness, not aggravated, not raising your voice, not screaming at them, not yelling. Come on. You say, well, i got a physical problem. 
will ask God to heal you that physical problem or be sure you don't pass on your medication. If your medication will make you be kind then, then take your medicine, baby. <laughs> and that goes for the men too. If you're one of them type people, well then take your medicine or drink your coffee. And if your coffee wires you, quit drinking coffee. If Coke's wire you, quit, come on now. In, in, even for the women, there ought to be, in their tongue ought to be a law of kindness. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Some of you that, that may, maybe, have you ever, you know, it can go both ways. The husband ought to be kind too, though. But this is Mother's Day. And we're just talking to the moms right now. We'll, we'll talk to the fathers. I'll be going on Father's Day, but, you know, we'll, I'll tell, talk to the fathers later. Kindness, law. It ought to be a law with you. Kindness. Mm. A virtuous woman. First Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. Watch this. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to, and a lot of people don't like this, to your own husband. That means you're to submit to your own husband, not somebody else's husband. You understand what I'm talking about? You, 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 you're not, you're not, it's not supposed to be the husband's a big old iron hand over you and you, everything he tells you to do, you know, wash my feet, baby. Wipe my mess up that I spilled. Do this, do that, do the other. Now, you know, praise God for the women that do that anyway and want to do it, but that's not what it's talking about. It says, you be in subjection to your own husband. That means you, you don't have to submit to nobody else's husband or no other man. Come on. And, and, that if they, oh, listen to this. Here's one, if you're married to a guy that's lost, if any obey not the word, some husband is lost, that they may also, may without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. How many of you know if that law of kindness is in your heart and in your mouth and in your mind, even if you have a husband that's not serving the Lord, if you keep on with that gentle spirit and that kind spirit, the next thing you know, that husband can be brought to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard testimonies of some saying, man, when I'd be ugly to them, it's like me sticking a knife in me whenever, you know, the Bible puts it this way, when, whenever we're kind to people with words and everything, it's like heaping coals of fire upon their head. You know, so a law of kindness will do all kinds of things. If we say, Lord, I want my voice, I want my tongue, to be under your control and I want to be have kindness and meekness coming out. And watch this now. Read on. And it says, while they behold your chaste conversation, your virtuous conversation, your good conversation, coupled with the fear, fear of the Lord. Go ahead. While whose adorning let it not be with the outward adorning and the plaiting of the hair and the wearing of gold and the putting on of apparel. Please know that God is not telling women not to wear gold and silver and all that like some Pentecostal churches believe, apostolic people in particular. That's not saying, it didn't say a woman ought not plait her hair. It just says, now watch this, read the rest of it. See, it says, don't let your outward adorning be that, but rather let it be the hidden part of man in the heart that is not corruptible. See, you can put on all the silver and gold you want and look real good, but if your heart is not where it ought to be, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, that, that right there is the part that God wants, the hidden part, it, to be right. And even the meek and quiet of an ornament, have that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God. Is he, and here he said, in the sight of God, it's a great price. How many of y'all want to be valuable to the Lord and be worth a lot to the Lord? He said, that, that meek and quiet spirit is of great price. Okay, real quick. We'll get through these. Other, and after that manner also in old time holy women also who trust in God adorn themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Their own husband, go ahead. And even as Sarah obeyed uh, Abraham calling him Lord and, and whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, you husband, dwell with him according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker. And see, the modern generation, the council culture, they would hate this as unto the weaker vessel. And that don't mean that you're not anything. You're not strong, but your husband's strong. But God created, there's a difference in your makeup. I'm talking about physically even, 
and you're not quite as strong as most men are when it comes to lifting real heavy loads and weight. And there's another thing sometimes some women are not. Some men are emotional, emotional, strong and solid and stable where sometimes some women get too much on them and then it bothers them more, okay? Sometimes, how many of y'all ever say, well, you don't act like it bothers you when you hurt my feelings. How many of you know men are kind of that way? They can go on anyway, you know, go on anyway. In fact, they can have a fuss or fight and then say, hey, honey, why don't you come over to my side of bed? And, I, I don't, I don't. and women are laying over there, you know, four hours later. <laughs> See, the men will forgive quickly, the women. No, I better shut up. <laughs> I'm getting deeper. Unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together to the grace of life. You know why he said that we ought to get together and we ought to treat, treat them with respect and with honor and to dwell with them, you know, learn to get along with them, learn to give in. Come on, men. Sometimes you have to give in. Women have to give in too. I understand that. But he says we dwell together. You know, you know why we're supposed to work together regardless of circumstances? He says that your prayers be not hindered. How many of you know when you're aggravated and you're fussing and you're fighting, it don't do too much good to pray right then, does it? Unless you're praying a prayer of repentance. Come on, anybody ever been so upset and so aggravated and so mad at their spouse? Come on, back when you were married even, I'm including y'all too. Come on. How many of y'all know sometime that wouldn't do no good to pray in the state you were in? Come on. But if you get that worked out and dwell together in unity and forgiveness and love, come on, and, and not be so mean and aggravating yourself sometimes. Even, you know, I don't know about you, but I want God to answer prayer, don't you? I want God to answer prayer. And I won't take time now, but uh, I, I, I wish we had a little more time. But again, that Proverbs 31 woman, that mother, was not lazy. She was a hard worker. There was kindness in her tongue. She looked well to the ways of her household. She raised her kids in a way that they were, people knew who they belonged to. They could see it. They could tell. Uh, I mean, there's, there's been, we, we've said this numbers of times. Let me just say most of you the same way. But Haley and Chris, we, 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 we have bragged on them before that a lot of time when their kids are out, when they have to be quiet, how a lot of time they're, they're uh, quiet and, and they're in a room or they're out at a table eating somewhere and they're not even hardly making no racket. Well, now, sometime you might have saw them run by you like a whirlwind, but they might have been chasing somebody else. I don't know who. And, uh, and it's kind of hard sometimes when one gets gone and the others want to get gone and it makes it hard. But when people care and raise their kids to be respectful and nice and obedient, let me tell you something. People don't mind being around them. And, 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 and uh, also God will bless you for it. But, but they look well to their house. They raise their kids. They tend to their household. They tend to their husband. And the Bible says that they're not, and I don't have time for this, not tattlers or busybody in other men's matters. And one thing it says, they if they don't watch out, if the women don't get married, they get idle and they become tattlers and they're busy about in other men's matter and speaking things which they ought not. And uh, they need to, the woman's place, the Bible says, back in the, during the, the Bible days, they were to guide the house, guide the house, the Bible said, and they didn't tell you you had to guide the husband. and. Um, let me, let me just say, and then it says that in Proverbs, there, as, as we would end with that if we went back to it, it says that their children and their husband rise up and call them blessed, and they praise his name. And, you know, there's nothing like that. I mean, I, I can, uh, you know, I know our, our daughters, uh, they love their mom, and they're, they're best friends with her. And they've, they've praised her time and time again. I've heard them praising her. They've praised her to me. They've praised her to other people. They've praised her in other churches and all. And, uh, and then uh, I, have, I have praised her before. And I don't know about you, but uh, how many of y'all would say, maybe we all, I, I know I need to, because I hadn't always been as kind and gentle. Because guess what? If a law of kindness ought to be in their tongue, the, the mom's tongue, 
it ought to be in the dad's tongue and the father's tongues. Come on. And the boyfriend's tongue, if it's supposed to be in the women's tongue, we ought to be a law of kindness in our hearts. i like for us to stand. I know you got to get out of here. And uh, I already went longer than I wanted to and didn't, didn't do justice in some of it. But let me just say this. If you, I don't want anybody to feel bad or feel condemned. But don't get me wrong. If, if you want to be one of those that not only your husband and your family will praise, but you want God to praise, well, then let's just say, okay, God, oh, me, you know, whatever. Because there's some traits there that are biblical that we need to look at, and I feel like we need to pursue. Now, are, are you, you may say, well, you think somebody needs it? I bound to have been somebody needed it because the Holy Spirit laid it on me so strong. Okay? That's all I can say. And if, uh, if you will say, okay, God owe me, help me, well, then God will do it if you mean business. And I'm not asking for no altar call this morning, uh, but I want you to know God will bless you, and He wants to satisfy you with long life and a great relationship with your family and with your husband. Some of you, your husband's already gone. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I still want to say Happy Mother's Day, and I'm not going to call you a birthing people. I want you to know I love you, and I thank God for you, and God loves you, and God will help you. Praise God.